Welcome, evening, everyone. Welcome to LGBTQ Plus History Month. It's me and Di tonight doing the introduction. Oh, we've got 78 people already. Um, so because Kelly and David are part of the panel, and Kelly normally asks you what you've had for tea stroke dinner, I thought we'd try something uh, different tonight with, along with the theme of rainbow flag, um, at rainbow and pride flag. And I thought I'd ask how you describe yourself about how you're feeling um, in terms of the weather, describe yourself. So for me, I feel a bit cloudy, but to bring my sunshine back, I would need um, to see my friends and family. So if we can- Feeling calm like the wind and rain makes you feel better. That's really good. Oh, I'm trying, right, let's see what we've got here. And David, take it back. Who's mentioned cake? If you still want to put what you what you had for tea or what you're going to have for tea, feel free. Cake. Someone said cake. So Kelly, your theme is still coming in. Food's always going to come into it, isn't it? And is it dinner <laughs> or is it tea? That's the question. <laughs> yes, yeah, some, some home cooked Caribbean food would definitely bring my rainbow and my my belly all out. <laughs> is a panel webinar so those of you who have been to our webinars before know that that means we need to get our um, webinar up and going very quickly because we've got so many fabulous guests tonight whose photographs you can see on the screen now but they will introduce themselves as each speaker um, begins their presentation but you will have met them on our social media over the last um, week but tonight is a fabulous webinar. Um, it was actually, it's being led tonight by Kelly, well, from our team, it's Kelly and David who brought tonight's webinar together from the team. And so um, Kelly's going to start us off and David's going to conclude the session. But when we were planning all of this, because um, I often do a bit of an introduction to the session. I was chatting to Kelly about, well, what can I do to say anything about uh, opening up the conversation? And I was talking about how important I think LGBTQ plus issues are for everybody in social work. And I was talking about when I was a student and I went on a march, um, I can remember it really vividly. I think I was a first year at university and we got a bus and we went to London and it felt really exciting, but we went on a march against, um, and the slides aren't moving for me now. We went on a march against what was then referred to as Clause 28. And I said to Kelly, do you know, I'll see, I think I've got some photos of myself. I'll look them out because I thought it was really important. Anyway, I've not been able to find a photo and Kelly got this photo. And when she sent me the slides, I thought, hang on a minute, is that me there behind Michael Cashman? Because I looked just like that in the 1980s, but it wasn't me. Um, so, um, but I do think that, Actually, you know, the sort of history and the oppression that people have faced is something that we've got to be very aware of as social workers. So um, Kelly and David have tonight put together a really fabulous session covering lots of different topics that are really important for us as social workers. So I'm not going to mess about at all. I'm going to hand straight over to Kelly, who is going to introduce the session for us and uh, let us know what we're going to learn about. Brilliant. Thank you, Siobhan. Um, yeah, so um, I'm desperate to see a picture of you in the 80s, by the way. I, I think you need, to, you need to keep looking, so I'm absolutely desperate to see that. Um, so that definitely isn't a picture of Siobhan, because in 1988, I think, um, I would have been six. So Manchester to London is quite far. That would have been quite a stretch. Um, yeah, so today I just wanted to do a bit of an introduction, really, into LGBTQ plus History Month. Um, and some of you might have seen on the previous slide that the... Um, the picture that was on was uh, the march against Clause 28, which then became Section 28 of the law. Um, and some of you may have seen the Pink Triangle, which has got its origins in the Pink Triangle that um, gay men were forced to wear in Nazi Germany in the concentration camp. So if we just think back to last week, this Pink Triangle is a bit of a symbol of um, protest um, for the LGBTQ plus um, community. So that's why that's there. Um, and I'm not going to talk for very long tonight. I'm going to hand over to our panellists. But I know that a lot of people, when they have questions um, about the LGBTQ plus community, 
um, or anxieties about talking about issues is that they don't really understand what the letters mean and they get them in the wrong order and they get them all mixed up and then when you don't know what to do you don't know what to say you kind of don't say anything you don't ask anything and I just want you to know that that's okay um, it's okay to get the letters wrong, it's okay not to know what they mean, it's okay not to include a letter, um, everybody's learning and there are new things that even I learn. So I just wanted to put this up on the screen which is the gender bred person. So we will send this out in the resources list but I thought it was a really kind of handy introduction. So this is the gender bred person um, as you can see. Um, LGB, lesbian, gay, bisexual is the sexuality bit and that links to the heart, so that's that's who you're attracted to. Um, and then the T is the gender bit, so that's the brain, and that's kind of what you think about yourself in terms of masculinity or femininity or uh, boy or girl, so that's, that's the gender bit. And then the Q is either queer or questioning, so that's, you could be questioning that you don't quite know where you fit in, but you know that you're not straight, so you're not heterosexual. Um, or you could identify as queer, which is a bit more of a political term, um, and it's a it's a bit of a. Oh, I don't know what happened there. Um, so a bit of a, a bit of a kind of um, umbrella term for the for the queer term because it's a political term. It's a term that's been used um, in a, as a slur, as a derogatory term over the over the years, and it's a term that a lot of LGBTQ plus people are reclaiming. Um, so that is sometimes what the Q stands for and the plus indicates that there, in, in underneath these identities there's lots and lots of different identities that come under those um, and then we do have some of our speakers will introduce you to a few more of them. So with the gender bred person you've got the brain which is your identity, how you think about yourself, the heart which is who you're attracted to, the sex which is my, male or female and then as you can see around him you've got the expression which is how you act so they can be, they can all align, they can be completely different, they can change over time. Um, nothing with your identity or who you're attracted to is, is really fixed and that's okay. And that's why a lot of people use the term queer because they, they identify with some elements of something but not the others and some people find labels helpful and some people don't find it helpful. Um, so I just wanted to say really that if you don't understand what the letters mean that's okay. If you don't know how to describe something that's okay as well. We're all learning together um, and then I'm going to hand over to our first panellist because we've got different people who are going to tell you a little bit about the work they do and then send you a brilliant list of resources that they've compiled afterwards. So I'm going to hand over to Ross. So Ross, if you can put your mic on and Siobhan will move the slides. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you to everybody for hosting me this evening. It's brilliant to meet you all. Um, I'm just gonna talk for just 10 minutes, a little bit about um, a concept that I've called living memory. And um, what I mean by living memory is the idea that as uh, human beings, we all have a kind of collective memory. We all have an understanding of the world we live in and what got us here. But I also think that we live our own memories. We are kind of a product of our own experiences and, and that affects the way we behave, the way we understand the world and the way that we interact with other people. So in this little talk, I'm going to move on from that concept, to how that applies globally and also how it applies historically in the experiences that we have in different parts of the world as humans and also throughout history. And I'll bring that all together by showing you very quickly a website that I worked on um, for a period of two years, thanks to the National Lottery Heritage Fund, where we interviewed well over 200 people in the West Yorkshire area who all came from an LGBTQ plus background and have all had a massive and diverse range of different experiences that they wanted to share, put out into the world so that people like you, if you've got any questions or if you just want to know more about different people's experiences from a queer perspective, can go onto the website, have a search through and listen to some of those experiences from the people's own, from the, in their own words. So I mentioned that our living memory um, is geographic as well as in time. So I wanted to show you this map that's produced by ILGA. ILGA is the International Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Trans and Intersex Association. 
They're a big umbrella organisation for loads of different LGBT plus campaigning groups right around the world. In fact, up from over 150 countries. And they quite regularly produce this uh, map. Um, and if you look, uh, you'll see that different countries are colour coded in different ways. Um, the more blue a country is, the more protective its laws are to LGBT plus people. The more red, the more repressive or even criminalising and punishing they are to people from LGBTQ plus background. So as an LGBT person, you are aware of the rest of the world. You're aware of other people who, who might go in really awful circumstances that you might yourself feel lucky not to have to face because you live in a different part of the world. But I think everybody carries that weight around with them of the experiences that other people are going through and also the experiences they could have if they visited that country or if they met somebody who'd had to flee that country for, for various difficult reasons. So there's loads of resources on that website and, and, this, and they're all quite regularly brought up to date and that map's a particularly good one uh, for looking kind of at international legal ways of thinking about the LGBT community. I also spoke about how we will um, carry around a kind of um, historical collective memory and that's why I wanted to just kind of whisk you through um, the last 50 years of LGBT history in this country. A lot of these um, relate to various laws that have changed obviously they have a huge impact on people's lives, whether they consider themselves to be breaking the law or not with their own behaviours, but knowing that they could be criminalised for certain things that they do obviously can create quite a bad feeling. So I've gone back to the 1967 Sexual Offences Act. This was the first time since the 1500s um, that um, acts between two men, as it was defined in the law, of a homosexual nature started to be decriminalised. It wasn't all good news, and I'll mention that a little bit later, um, but it did bring in a new era of LGBT rights and upfront campaigning, such as groups like the Campaign for Homosexual Equality that began in 1969, and the Stonewall Riots that focused on a bar in New York City and brought a lot of high profile attention to the struggles of LGBT plus people. That led eventually to the 1972 Pride March, which was the first in the UK that took place in London and was organised by the Campaign for Homosexual Equality and the Gay Liberation Front. And that ushered in a, a whole era of political change. Um, by the time we reached um, the early 80s, the act that I mentioned from 1967 in the UK started to be brought in. And that's quite a gap when you think about it of over a decade. Um, of course, uh, the 80s also ushered in what's referred to as the AIDS era. And if you've been watching It's a Sin on Channel 4, you'll be seeing a really vivid depiction of that era. Um, when AIDS started to become known by people, it also cast a huge shadow um, over perceptions of particularly gay people and also particularly by men who were sometimes blamed for um, crossing this so-called gay disease over into the straight world. And throughout the rest of that decade, a lot of ill feeling was kind of, um, was faced by LGBT plus people. By the end of that decade, and um, we started to see a couple of more high, pro high profile people like Ian McKellen, um, starting charities like Stonewall UK to help with some of the problems that people have faced. Um, and throughout the 90s as well, um, these different uh, laws started to change different ways. So in 1994, for example, the age of consent for, for gay men, which had been 21, was lowered a little bit to 18. But you can still imagine how that kind of affects people's perceptions that um, gay people, for instance, were somehow different to straight people. I put on for that same year about Sandy Toxer. I still find this an interesting little story that she was dropped from hosting a charity event from, uh, for Save the Children because it became known that she was lesbian. She didn't receive an apology from the charity for 20 years after that, but a group called the Lesbian Avengers did mount some protests in her cause. In 1999, a, a pub in London called the Admiral Duncan, a, a gay bar, was bombed, which killed three people, injured many more. That kind of event is going to leave scars with people, and, and it's well within living memory. Um, you, you may well encounter people in your work and in your life who remember that, and who maybe have never quite shed that fear of going out because of what could happen to them when they do. And on my last parts of the timeline here, there's a few more... Um, legal events that, that came in, things like the Gender Recognition Act of 2004 that um, saw, well, it started to pave the way uh, for people to be recognised other than the gender they were assigned at birth, but rather the gender that they actually are. And they're starting to get some legal 
um, recognition for that. It's not always as simple as that, as we'll see a little bit later on, but there are, these changes do come about and, um, and that's what I'm trying to do with this timeline, just to kind of whisk you through it. So you'll see a few others on there, like the Asian Centre to refer to coming out um, and civil partnerships coming in in 2004 between people of the same sex. I always am slightly surprised that it's 10 years till you get to 2014 where it becomes marriage. I lived through that period and, you know, 10 years is quite a long time. And um, on my final part of this little timeline here, I've just put in two recent events to sort of illustrate how, how things change so quickly. So you probably remember back in 2017 when Trump banned trans people from the military, another hugely kind of devastating blow, which thankfully has been reversed by Joe Biden, but shows you how volatile situations are for LGBT people. One day the things they do are considered legal, the next they're not, and it can change so quickly like that. So before I run out of time, I better tell you a little bit about West Yorkshire Queer Stories, which is the project I mentioned at the beginning. This was where we interviewed people from the local um, area, and many of them actually spoke about a lot of the different things that I mentioned there on in mind. So if anything there that you've heard of, not sure what it was, but want to know more, you're bound to find something on West Yorkshire Queer. So this is um, a little illustration of what the website looks like. It's literally 200 different stories, all broken down by subject and theme. You can search it by keyword or theme, uh, and you can search it by area, different age groups, all sorts of stuff. And I've pulled out a couple of examples and stories that you can listen to. I put their links in the information that's gonna be circulated afterwards. So for instance, you can listen to the story of Helen. She grew up in the 1950s and considers herself, she is a trans person, but in the 1950s, that was completely not understood. So you can listen to what it was like growing up when that category of people didn't even exist. Uh, I mentioned about decriminalization, as it was called in 1967. Uh, Robert's story on the West Yorkshire Queer Story website looks at how that was actually a bit problematic and how even though it might be the case that certain laws have been repealed, suddenly the police had loads of new laws, uh, loads of new um, record, um, loads of new things they could basically catch you for. And he talks about when gay people became a bit more prominent in society and in views of the law, how that could actually be turned against them. Two other stories that I'll just mention that I think are well worth looking at are John's experiences growing up in Wakefield in the 1980s, becoming aware of AIDS and how that affected his behaviour from feeling safe about going out and meeting other people or to not coming out because he didn't want to be associated with AIDS. And finally, the story of Coburn, who's out and trans at school today um, and talks about what it's like um, to be perceived as that by different people, including teachers. So they're just some examples from the website. I really recommend getting on to um, West Church Square Stories and having listened through to all those different stories. It's such a great resource. Um, and anybody that you're dealing with in your work um, will probably um, have similar experiences to the sorts that are described on there. So they're well worth listening to. And um, feel free to ask me any questions in the chat and I'll do my best to answer them as usefully as I can. But thanks very much for listening to me tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Ross. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and just, I mean, one of the things I love is, and I think that social work is all about people's stories. You know, it's what we do as social workers and learning from narratives and stories, I think is so valuable. And I've always been fascinated by like social history as well. So just listening to what you were saying there was just, you know, so much learning in it for me. But I was just thinking about the, the power of stories and people's narratives and how I'm definitely going to be on that website probably straight after the session tonight just listening to some of those narratives because I think we do learn such a lot from stories and then you mentioned of course it's a sin which everybody is loving at the moment takes me right back to the 80s takes me back to that look that I had Kelly you know that hairstyle that I telling you about earlier and the music of it and everything but also just the stories and how people have become so involved in the stories of the people in it's a sin and how really we are, we do all want to be a bit more jill you know which is that um hashtag isn't it just be more jill so thank you so much for that ross i know there'll be loads of questions for you now and lots going on in the chat so thank you for sharing that with us that was brilliant L such a lot of rich learning for us there about history and global narratives. So thank you for that.
We're going to move on now to thinking, um, I suppose, a bit more specifically. We've, we've opened with a kind of wide understanding there. And what we're going to do is look a bit more specifically at um, these issues in terms of social work. So we've got a guest returning who was with us a, a few weeks ago. If you're a regular attender, you'll remember Jason from the um, webinar on social work and men. So Jason, if you want to pop your microphone on and start your presentation. Uh, thanks very much, Siobhan, and uh, lovely to see everybody here for this uh, webinar about LGBT History Month. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, professional discomfort with sexuality and gender identity, and this is predominantly in relation to social workers, but does relate to uh, some of the other uh, helping professions. And I've got about 10 minutes, so I'm going to move through these pretty quickly. But I did want to just point out a couple of resources of note that you might find useful. So the UK National LGBT Survey that you might be aware of, and if you're from outside of the UK, you may not be. It was the largest survey of its kind ever undertaken in the UK, and they were absolutely overwhelmed by the number of responses that they got. So it's a huge amount of information about the state of people's lives and how they feel about living in the UK if they're LGBT. And there are a couple of things that come out of that that I think are helpful for us to be thinking about. So the, the proportion of non-binary non and transgender and genderqueer people is increasing as, their, um, as generations change and actually um, how uh, people feel discriminated against uh, across the, the entirety of their lives. But also that some people feel different types of discrimination depending upon how old they are. So if you get a chance to take a look at that, I would um, strongly recommend it. The massive publication you can probably avoid if you, unless you're like me and want to read the whole thing and look at the little one because um, there is a small executive summary. The other two things that I just want to point out is that there is a special interest group specifically for sexuality and social work. And it does um, expand to include gender identity. That's just not a part of the title. It's an international group that has a biannual conference. Um, and there's a couple of websites um, there for you if you're interested in it. And for those people, because I've seen a couple of points um, in the chat already about looking for further information, um, there's a couple of books that I would probably, uh, that I would strongly recommend that I think you should take a look at if you're looking for further information about this. And um, this will come around in the pack. I've put together some references of things that I would um, suggest are helpful. And I just want to point out the, the, the two books on the far right. Um, that um, it says LGBT health inequalities, but um, Julie Fish is a social worker and has done some spectacular work in the UK about identifying, the UK and internationally, about identifying some of the impacts um, of being LGBT in, in modern society. Um, and she's pulled together a really fascinating edited collection. And then the other book, um, Social Work with Lesbians and Gay Men, is from two of the sort of powerhouses of, of LGBT social work in the UK. Christine Cocker and Helen Kosas Brown, and I can't recommend those two texts enough. The other thing I have to say um, is uh, I do my own research and I couldn't use, uh, skip this opportunity without pointing out a call for participants. So I've got a couple of studies going on currently, um, one that's looking at social care assessments of older people, uh, another that's looking at LGBT younger people, and then this study called Autonomy, which is recruiting participants for a study using photo elicitation for neurodivergent and gender diverse young people. Um, and there's some information that is, will be coming around to you on the next slide and can uh, help you understand what the um, information is. So one of the other questions for you to, to get you to think about from this is, why is it that some people are uncomfortable about discussing sexuality and gender identity in a professional context? So just to get you to think about this, what might be the origins what might be the dangers and what are the potential impacts? Um, and some of the research that I've done and, and colleagues of mine have done can answer some of these questions, but it's helpful for us to be thinking about these as we start engaging with um, people's lives. So what we do know about um, these issues is that sexuality is not easily engaged with by some social workers. And that can be for a bunch of reasons, but primarily the two main reasons in the surveys that have been done are about um, people's uh, um, uh, significant religious belief that they hold, or the other main uh, reason that people identified was a feeling of a lack of knowledge and training. And that, that struggle that social workers hold can be felt as discrimination by service users, as well as their colleagues. And that means that it can also restrict the support that's offered by social workers. And that's what's really important to identify that those have impacts for individuals. 
So then um, if we think about the way that uh, social workers respond to this, so they generally have a poor understanding of sexuality and that's not to criticize social workers because they're probably doing their best, but as a profession in comparison to some other healthy professions, we do sort of lag behind a little bit. Um, and social workers, sometimes if they're interested in this, seek broader knowledge about the topic. They report to us that they often experience homophobia and transphobia in the workplace and a range of heterosexism. And uh, what's interesting, I think, in one of the, the pieces of research that I did was that over half indicated that their qualifying degree didn't equip them with adequate knowledge, with enough knowledge to be able to, what they felt to support working with and engaging and supporting LGBT people. And oftentimes when people talk about why um, people are uncomfortable talking about sexuality and gender identities, because it's private and they suggest that that means that it's uncomfortable to talk about. Well, one of the things that we know from other areas of work, um, and this is a quote by Dominelli, that so sexuality is, whilst it's identified as private, social work is a process where the private arena move into the public. And that's a helpful um, sort of concept to help us understand that if we think about, say, child protection, there's probably few things that are more private than the way that we raise our children. And that means that social workers have a lot of skills of engaging with people's private arenas. And I think we need to be considering about talking about sexuality and gender identity from that perspective, that whilst it is private, we do have some skills about engaging with that. Then the other thing to be thinking about is that even though sexuality does relate to the expression of intimacy between individuals, and that means it is private, that individual expression is mediated and scripted. So it's played out through the social world, which means that our engagement with other people um, is connected to that and affected by that. And I just wanna take a minute um, to sort of contrast what is the normative sexuality and what is the um, sort of minority sexuality. And these have been identified from um, a long time ago and, and in fact, hasn't really shifted much since this publication in the eighties. So we look on the left, there's the heterosexual, marital, monogamous, reproductive and non-commercial. And on the other side, the minority side, the discriminated side of the oppressed is homosexual, unmarried, promiscuous, non-procreative and commercial. And when I've been creating these slides, I was looking for something that was not discriminatory for promiscuous and there isn't one. The only word that could be used would be non-monogamous, which isn't really exactly the same thing. Um, and I wanna point out that some of the current legislation in the UK recommends that not only social workers be trained to combat homophobia and transphobia, and, but they also must promote LGBT equality. And that's a really important element that social workers in the UK sometimes um, are surprised by or feel that they're um, not sort of prepared for, that they um, are sort of unaware of their, their own sort of requirements for this. In addition, the IFSW um, suggests the ethical requirements for social workers challenge negative discrimination. And within that identifies sexual orientation as an area which the discrimination should be challenged. So externally to the UK, there is, there is um, international support around that. Now, one of the last things that I just wanna point out for you is um, there is a document that is useful for you if you're wanting to consider how to make your workplace or your placement or indeed your university that you're studying at more LGBT friendly. Um, most of those organizations have some um, documents like that that relate to their own specific organization. But this is a document that can be really useful about identifying some changes that individuals or groups might feel can make it a more inclusive environment. And one of those things is about putting up, whether it's posters for individuals so that they can see that when they're sitting in a waiting room or rainbow lanyards and rainbow um, badges on lanyards if those things are allowable. Because what we know, and this is one of the other pieces of research that we know about, is that LGBT people look for those signs to identify whether an organization that they haven't engaged with before is going to be homophobic. So they're looking for a way to prove to them that this is a safe place for them to be. So all of those things about identifying whether it's using pronouns when you talk to people or identifying that you're an LGBT ally or indeed you're a member of the LGBT community, all of those things are really important for people to be able to identify that it's a safe place for them. Um, I didn't do an introduction for myself at the beginning because Siobhan did such a good one for me, but I'm Jason Schaub and I'm at the University of Birmingham and all my stuff is about LGBT people. Thanks very much.
Thank you uh, so much, Jason. Again, found that fascinating. Um, and I was saying to you earlier that you're one of the only people that we've had as a returning guest to a webinar because I think you've really brought with it, with you some research that is so relatable and so understandable and so helpful to social workers. So thank you so much for that. I tell you, I, what I was really um, interested in there, well, you were saying that in many ways, students and perhaps social workers not feeling prepared by their training or feeling um, that they have, you know, a lack of understanding or poor understanding. And actually, that's something we've been trying to do through these webinars is extend aspects of the curriculum that we think aren't being covered, that students are telling us aren't being covered. And I think this is something that I'm sure that because I can't read the chat when I'm screen sharing, but I'm sure that I'll see in the chat later that people are saying, in that isn't being covered I think as part of social work training and yet is really important and I just loved the way you talked about that private issue and people saying oh well it's private so let's not talk about it actually pretty much everything we do in social work is private so why are we avoiding one particular area it says a lot about um attitudes and bias so um I found that really fascinating I was writing loads of notes as you were talking so um for myself just such a lot of learning in that so thank you so much for that Jason and we're going to go on now. One of the things we really like is having um, guests with, um, I suppose, at different stages of their social work journey. So um, we've just learned from Jason as a social work academic, but now we're going to go and learn from Eric as a social worker. So if you can put your mic on, Eric, and start your presentation. Okay. Hi, everyone, um, and thank you so much for having me and inviting me to speak. Um, so I'm Eric Banks, I'm an ASYE social worker. I'm currently working in a children looked after team. Um, I'm also LGBT plus rep for SWAG, which is Social Work Action Group, which is basically a group of parents, professionals and students, which kind of come together to change social work for the better. Um, so I'm passionate about sharing the views of transgender and non-binary people specifically. Um, I feel like this group is often missed and it's really important that we share um, everyone's voices. Um, and I'm going to focus on how we can improve our practice as social workers for this specific group. Um, I've worked with a number of gender variant young people and I feel that sharing this knowledge with you all can help to tackle the misunderstanding and sometimes intolerance of transgender identities within social work. Um, although I'm a children's practitioner, um, as this is my area of knowledge, uh, I feel like it, this can easily be applied to um, transgender and non-binary people of any age. Um, it's important that we acknowledge the gaps in social work education practice guidance and knowledge in terms of working with transgender and non-binary people. Um, so just so we're all on the same page, I'm just going to do some quick definitions um, from Stonewall. Um, so we've just gone to that. Yeah. Um, so we've got trans or transgender, which is an umbrella term to describe people whose gender is not the same as or doesn't sit comfortably with the sex they're assigned at birth. Um, so this could be someone that was born male and identified as female, uh, born female, identified as male. Um, and then we've got non-binary, which is a much wider spectrum um, of gender identities that are not exclusively masculine or feminine identities are outside of the gender binary. Um, and just on the flip side of trans, so if the opposite, if you like, um, cisgender or cis is short for someone um, whose gender identity matches the sex they were assigned at birth. Um, just so we all know what those terms mean. Um, so I feel that transgender and non-binary young people are struggling to ensure their voices are heard and that social workers are up to date and aware of issues such as transphobia and homophobia, which affect them on a daily basis. Not only this, but the increased scepticism and debate around transgender people in the media, for example, on social media such as Twitter, um, on news articles, uh, are undoubtedly having a knock-on effect for our young people. Um, so I asked a group of transgender and non-binary, um, a youth group that I volunteer with, um, to answer the question, what would you like your social worker to know when, I work, when working with you? Because um, I think it's really important that we share their views. Um, I can tell you what I think about best practice and about tips for working with transgender and non-binary youth, but it's better to come from them themselves. Um, so just on the screen now is what they've said. Um, so I'm just going to go through them um, and then pick out some points to really focus on. So they said they want their social worker to know about um, what future they want, their sexuality, their gender, their mental health triggers, who they're out to, um, the freedom to speak freely, so that's something they'd like, uh, helping closer to the youth, how to stop panic attacks, their interests, how they feel, um, their motivations and their identity. Um, so just to pick out two really key points to that, 
Um, so in terms of the freedom to speak freely, so as social workers, we should be non-judgmental. We should be accepting of all gender identities and sexualities. Um, it's not our goal as social workers to assess the authenticity of our young people's gender or sexuality, but our job as social workers is to support them unconditionally and they should know that they have someone to come to that's a safe adult that they can speak to about um, their gender or sexuality. Um, and then just another one to focus on is who I'm out to. So often we have young people who um, maybe if they're in care, they have a number of professionals working with them. For example, they have their foster carer, they have their social worker, they have people at school. It's really important that we know who they are out to um, so that we don't accidentally out people and so that we, um, we protect their gender and sexual identity so that they um, so that they feel comfortable and that they know that you will not share that information without their consent. Um, so I just have a story from one of these young people um, that, uh, I asked, that I asked for this feedback for this um, webinar. So a young person who was 16 um, started exploring their gender identity at home and told their social worker that they were feeling confused about their gender identity and they wanted some support with it. Um, so the social worker put this down to puberty and um, in this young person's words, they didn't know anything about the topic or try to find out, which left me alone and in the dark. Um, so that kind of just highlights how we really need to have a good understanding of sexuality, of gender, so we can support young people as best as possible. Um, so now I'm just going to go on to some sort of best practice tips or practical advice. Um, so in terms of in the office, so things that are easy to do um, to show that you're an open ally is one of our points is there. Um, so we can add pronoun to our email signatures, whether that's um, just my, I have on my emails, my pronouns are he, him, um, other people do more of an explanation, but I think that's a really easy way to show that you're a trans ally and that you support LGBT plus people. Um, so attend research and training. So obviously this event is great um, to learn more about LGBT plus identities and history. Um, and often there isn't much training in, um, in local authorities. So when there is to really take those opportunities to learn more and um, to celebrate LGBT plus history month. So again, like this event, um, and Trans Day of Remembrance, which often gets forgotten, and um, that's on the 20th of November, basically uh, acknowledging the trans people that have lost to um, hate crime and um, have been basically murdered in the year previous. Um, and then just to challenge homophobia and transphobia, especially with, to the people we work with. So this can be really subtle, um, whether that's used, so if a young person uses they, them pronouns to make sure that we're using them even when they're not present, even if, um, it maybe doesn't come as naturally as using he, him or she, her. It's really important that we respect a young person's wishes. We use their preferred name, we use their pronouns, um, we speak about their gender and sexuality um, confidently and in regards to what they'd like, us, how they'd like us to speak. And then again, just to be an open ally, which kind of touches on what Jason was speaking about in terms of um, openly showing that we support LGBT plus young people rather than um, taking more of a backseat. Um, and then if you just go on to the next slide, please. So I've kind of created this um, anagram because I think it's easier to remember, which is to be ants. Um, so in terms of um, being ants, it's to A, be accepting. So a young transgender person needs to trust that professionals will accept them despite potential conflicts in personal values or ethics. So it's really important that we're all really aware of our values, of our potential um, thoughts around gender identity, which we need to be really aware of when working with young people so we don't push our biases onto them. Um, and then to be non-judgmental. So again, young persons should be open-minded, listen to young people without judgment and be a safe adult for them to speak to. Um, trans affirmative, so a professional should act as a trans ally and advocate for trans people where possible. Um, that includes finding out more information if someone um, identifies the gender you've not, you've not heard of before, um, going away, researching and supporting them as best possible. And then to be sensitive, so coming out topics of sexuality and gender can be awkward and embarrassing for young people to navigate. It's crucial for pra practitioners to have empathy and approach these topics sensitively. Um, I think another one just to add is that if you, I think a lot of the time practitioners when they work with transgender and non-binary young people, they worry about making a mistake, worry about getting it wrong. And um, if you do get things wrong, so if you used to call a young person um, their dead name, so their name pre-transition, or use the wrong pronouns, just apologise, move on. I'm sure a young person will be able to um, 
help you navigate their gender identity and their journey um, as best possible. Um, so I've got a booklet that's kind of put together all of these ideas which we sent out in the resources. Um, feel free to DM me on Twitter any questions or ask me here and I'll do my best to answer. Um, but yeah, that's, that's me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, I thought that was brilliant. And again, I suppose the strength of us learning from narratives uh, that we were saying with Ross really came through, didn't it? When you asked that young person and that really captured me when you said the young person said the social worker, the social worker's response left them feeling alone and in the dark. And I think for us as social workers, that's the thing we absolutely do not want to do with anybody is leave people alone and in the dark. So that really caught me. But and I love the idea of the ants. I mean, I know you've sent that to us for us to be able to send out to people. And I know people will find that useful. I always love using like little things that are helpful like this. But I was also thinking just about the fact that an ant is a very small thing, but can actually carry a huge thing, can't it? So a small ant can carry like a really big leaf or something can carry something three times its size and it's that bit about something that could be it sounds very small but actually can mean a real huge thing to a, a young person so I think the ants idea is fabulous as well so thank you so much for that presentation and I know everybody always really likes hearing from um, social workers and practitioners and you doing your ASYE as well will probably lead to even more questions on that as well so thank you for coming and sharing with us. Um, and so we're going to go now to our next presentation. So, um, Rena, if you're ready, if you can put your mic on and start your presentation. All right. Thank you, Siobhan. And thank you, Eric. My name is Rena, and my pronouns are they, them. And I am a student social worker and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for being here today. I will be talking about support for families with LGBTQ plus children. So we will start off with the next slide talking about the different processes that families will go through when their child comes out to them. And these processes include denial, grief, blame and guilt, fear, anger, self-realization and self-acceptance. So we're gonna start off with denial. So initial denial or disbelief is very common. Many parents, they might already have an inkling that their child is gay or trans or part of the LGBT community, but they may suppress that and deny it because of the fear, of the fear that they don't know how the community will react or the family will react. And so they stay in that denial process. The child... Well, the parent might feel that this is a phase, that the child is rebelling um, or that this is an experiment during the child's life. But it's so important for the parent to understand and, and see this as an important stage in the child's life because it is not a rebellion, it's not an experiment and it certainly isn't a phase. And so it's important for parents to take it um, as their word. The next slide is about grief. So parents might, well, families, parents, they may feel that they're losing their child. The child that they brought up to be a certain way has now told them that they are not going to um, act in the way that their family wants them to. And so the parent may go through a process of grief, um, going through that loss of the child that they once knew grieving the future dreams that they wanted for their child um, and going through that mourning of the disappearance of, of a life that they had created and now this life is changing. Um, an example may be um, a father may have dreamt to walk his daughter down the aisle um, with the hopes that she would marry a man and this may not be the case if that once daughter has now said that they are transgender um, and are now going to be living as the gender they are um, in their head. Um, but the positive thing about this is that dreams change over time and parents and families with their children can form um, more positive um, dreams for the future. 
The next slide is about blame and guilt. Families may start to blame themselves, asking, well, why me? Why is my child gay? Why is my child trans? Why is this happening to me? Why can't everything just be normal? And this puts a lot of pressure on the parents as well as the children themselves because they feel like they are to blame when really sexuality or gender, there is nothing to blame about that. And the parents may also blame people around them and think that the children are being influenced by media, by actors, by, um, by other trans people, by other gay people. So it's so important for parents to not blame their child and actually go through this process. The next process, the part of the next process is fear. And this is when they're starting to realize that, okay, my child is gay or my child is trans. Um, and they might fear breaking that silence and taking the truth, telling the truth. They might fear being judged losing their friends, their family, their community. They might fear hatred, violence, discrimination. And all of these are realistic possibilities for both the parent and the child. And this is why it's even more important for the parents to support the child so that they can protect each other. The next one is anger. So parents might start to feel angry with themselves, angry with god if they they have a faith asking god and questioning god of why me why is my child gay um they might even be angry at their religious community for rejecting or condemning the lgbt community and lgbt families they might even get angry at their own child for causing upheaval in the family or being different or not being able to keep this part of them to themselves just to keep the family peace. So it's so important for parents to deal with their own anger and not direct it towards the child. Whilst going through the process, once they get over the angry, um, the anger part, the next one is self-realization. And this is when families finally come to the realization that it's not that their child has to change, it's that they have to change. And this is when they start to realize, okay, I need to sit with my child and we've got to now redraw a different family picture that includes the new reality of their child being part of the LGBT community. And what they may start to do is find support services for themselves and for their child. They you know, they may surround themselves with other loving parents and friends, finding groups and people that are going through the same thing. And this is a point where families start to learn from each other and recognize that they don't know everything, but they are willing to learn about their child. And the last part of this process is self-acceptance. And this basically means they, they love their child, they accept their child, they realize that they don't love their child in spite of who they are, but just as they are. And this is when everyone can now accept themselves. And this creates a safe space for the child. The child can feel safe to talk about their gender, their sexuality and everything that they are going through. And they can build a good life and become their best selves. So this is the process um, that families go through. The next bit is how can I support my child? So how can you as a parent, as family member, as chosen family, support your child who has come out to you? And this is how you can do it. Show your child explicitly that you accept them and you want to support them. And if they are feeling confused or they, you know, they're coming to terms with their gender identity, you're there for them to talk to. You may not understand a few things and it's okay especially if this is new for you, but learn from your child, do your research, learn from different organizations and be ready to talk about things with your child as uncomfortable as it may be in the beginning. You know, sex and, and gender and sexuality and all these, these things 
aren't can, can sometimes be taboo especially in different religious and um in different cultural settings where it's not normal for parents to talk about sex sexuality with their child but this is the time where that boundary can be can be crossed so that you can have fulfilling conversations about each other it's also important to go at the child's pace you know you don't want to be bombarding your child about really explicit or really intimate things about body and sex if they aren't comfortable with doing so so it's really important that you understand this is their journey of discovery this is their journey of expression and so go at their pace and really ease the conversation with them communication is everything so like i said talk listen be respectful ask how your child wants to be addressed whether it's changing pronouns whether it's he him she her z their they them be able to understand that accept that and just respect that because it doesn't hurt to use somebody's pronoun um it can actually save a life so and if you do make a mistake it's okay correct yourself apologize and allow yourself to learn um and always come from um a position of love and compassion and also you don't need to learn everything you won't know everything you won't know all the terms and all the language i'm part of the lgbt community and i don't still know everything and i'm not expected to know everything so be at go at your own pace as well as long as you and your child are working together to figure things out finding a supportive group for your child can be really helpful support groups organizations i've linked a few at the end um doing your research and you know joining virtual groups um are really important and really nice for you to meet other families who either identify as lgbt or have lgbt children and i think another important thing is you know it is understandable if you're feeling anxious as a parent if you're feeling upset if you're feeling scared um and the most important thing is that you're honest you're honest about these feelings you're honest with other adults that you trust about these feelings and this is why the support groups are really helpful or just meeting other people with similar experiences because you're able to talk about these experiences with others and that can really help so yeah that is how you can best support your child and now i want to read a few quotes and from a trans person and a few parents that i found on gendered intelligence um it's so important to give them a voice so first one a parent said i was not particularly taken aback but i was taken aback by my own physical reaction because i just couldn't stop crying I, it was uncontrollable i tried to analyze why that was the case i think it's wrapped up with a parental guilt i wanted to have been able to help my child the second thing is the realization of the pain and confusion that my child must have gone through but i'm very very happy and positive for him other parents have said i feel it's the same person the person inside is exactly the same person that i've always loved it's not a different being it's the same child i had to accept that it is real it's so clear that our daughter wants to go down that path the sort of unhappiness that she's had in trying to deal with the outside world and you observe this and you think well you wouldn't be doing this if it was just some psychological problem that perhaps some counseling would solve and a young trans person said even when i transitioned with my family because of social dynamics with my family i found that i was different with them than when i was with other people i found that the dynamic of me being their son before was still there when i first transitioned and it was only after a period of time when my relation to them as a daughter had been built up that i felt affirmed and another parent said we have regained the person that was lost for a while because they are so miserable they withdraw and you don't know what's going on and when they are able to be who they want to be and they are happier you can regain that connection so it was really important for me to put those quotes there those voices so you can see if you can notice the processes some parents were in guilt some parents were accepting um and yeah you can really see the process through the quotes there and what i always say is 
lead with compassion, listen with respect, love them unconditionally. They are your children, the children that it just matters if they're happy and healthy. And yeah, you should love them unconditionally so that they can be happy with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rena, for sharing that. Um, and the resources are there that you um, said you'd share at the end. And I know also we'll be sending resources out to people who've attended after the webinar. But thank you so much for sharing that. I actually found that really helpful as you were working through it. It was really clearly structured for us. But I suppose what it did as well was it pulled together what I think has been the golden theme, the kind of golden thread running through everybody's presentations. And when we do these panels, we don't plan them to have this thread. It's just the thread often appears on the night. But for me, the golden thread that's run through everybody's is about the importance of narratives, the importance of stories. And you sharing those voices really showed that, you know, the importance of understanding from a perspective of a person's narrative and we all have our own stories don't we and I think everybody that's here in the webinar tonight um, whether listening or presenting has our own story so thank you so much for what you shared tonight thank you Rena. And we're going to go now to our uh, final speaker of the evening, who is a Connect team member. So um, we started with a Connect team member. We're going to get, conclude with a Connect team member. Um, and I'm not quite sure uh, what David is going to share with us. So I'm going to let David um, tell you himself what he's going to share with us. Um, but I do know that this is a piece of artwork that David has done for us uh, for tonight, which I think is a fabulous piece of artwork, you will all agree. And I'm going to ask David if he wants to put his microphone on and tell us, David, what uh, you're going to share with us tonight. My heart's going. Um, thank you, Siobhan. And um, so I was going to share a poem from my poetry book, um, which was about the... Um, people in the community not being accepted by others in the community. But then after you guys encouraged me to watch This Is A Sin, um, it's a sin um, I came up with another poem that's a thank you to the generations that have come before all of us um, and who have fought for further equality and where we are now. Obviously there's more um, challenges still to be faced, but there's been a long battle since the 60s. And this poem is as a thank you to the generations before us and the allies like, like Sir Siobhan. Who, who marched for us. So um, <clears throat> so if you guys just keep that in mind, um, it shouldn't take me too long, but I haven't learned it by heart yet because I'm not a spoken word poet. So yeah, thank you. To the kings and queens of the LGBT, the fabulous and the gruff, the boys who love boys and the girls who like girls and the queens that like both or the queen that was born a queen but was meant to lead as a king. I am proud of you. The way you stand your ground and you root like a tree, deep, steady, an example to stand pr proud and defend the new saplings as they grow. You oversee their progression and teach them how they can reach the skies. You take the wind blast so the next generation can grow up strong and proud. You have progressed the tree line, empowered the green belt and allowed an acre after acre the safety to feel free. And one day there will be no fear of being culled. To the kings and queens of the LGBT, you may feel used and underappreciated, abused and tormented. But I am telling you that though you may not have a crown bejeweled in rubies and thorns, you are the people that live on in my mind. You adorn my kingdom's throne. Thank you for pushing through pain, taking the scares and the scars and the slurs so that our young might thrive and shine bright so they may lead the way for the happy and the loved. La. So. <laughs> La. <laughs> La. <laughs> We've been doing that a little bit in our team meetings a little bit occasionally. Thank you so much, David. You, you, you are growing into the poet laureate or whatever the term is of the Student Connect team. So thank you very much for sharing that poem with us. Well, thank um, you for letting me. 
Thank you. I can see that there, it's been very busy in the Q&A tonight. I can see uh, there's hundreds of comments in the chat. I'm always desperate to go in and have a look at the chat, but I have to manage the slides, which means if I start to try and look at the chat, it, it loses all kinds of things. So I will read the chat um, later on. But thank you so much to all of our guests tonight. I don't know if I'm going to just return to Kelly because we do still have a couple of minutes left, Kelly. Um, and I'm just going to return to Kelly if that's okay with you just to see if there has been anything in the questions that we still need an answer for if there's been anything in the chat or if you would just like to reflect on how the webinar has gone it was your kind of vision for having this webinar so would you like to just uh, conclude a little bit for us at all Kelly? Yeah, um, thanks Siobhan. Um, I just want to say thank you to all the panellists. Um, like Siobhan says we don't um, when we plan these webinars, we, we have a general theme and the theme was that it was LGBT History Month. Um, and Siobhan's fantastic in that if you say, I wonder if we could do this, she's like, yeah, great, do it, pick a date. Um, and we don't, we don't kind of have a think about what we want to be covered. Um, we just we just look for panelists. We look for people who are saying interesting things, and then we give them a platform on the night. And I think tonight has been a fantastic example of everybody speaking about something that is really personal to themselves, um, and somehow managing to cover a whole range of topics. Um, and that kind of golden golden thread that runs through it that somehow it does come together. And I think that's the value of people's personal stories. Um, if you let people speak about what's important to them then it will be worthwhile. It's always worthwhile and it can never not be important. Um, I just wanted to encourage you all to look at your history, um, look at the LGBT community um, and their history, look at some of the struggles that people have faced, like David mentioned, um, because I think only by, only by understanding where a community has come from and the oppression and maybe um discrimination that they've faced and are still facing can you really understand um how that community is feeling obviously it'll be different for different people but i think you know what if you haven't watched it's a sin watch it if you don't know what section 28 is find out um if you don't know what ida hobbit is then find out about that we will send you loads of resources but do your research it's okay not to know everything and like Rena said you can be part of the LGBT community you know I've been out for a lot of years and I still find things I don't know like it's okay just be respectful try to find out ask if you're not sure um, and look at the history because it's only when we know it's only when we understand where we've come from that we understand where we're going um, and that's that's all I wanted to say. The numbers have stayed really high all night, which is fantastic. So thank you to our speakers. You've been absolutely amazing. And thank you to the Student Connect team for being on board with this. Um, no reservations. Everybody has got on board, which is fantastic. So that's it from me. Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. Um, and uh, speaking as a team member, I think, you know, the whole team wanted to get on board and will always support one another in the ideas that we bring for the webinars. So thank you so much. Thank you very much to all of our panellists. And um, I, I would encourage you all to follow them on social media To I did notice earlier there was a bit of an error on the slides in that Jason's um, research that he talked about didn't come up and I, I apologise for that Jason but I did retweet it earlier it is all over our social media and we will make sure that people get the links out to that research so um, you know do follow up on what you've learned tonight because for me gosh it's been rich with learning tonight and I'm definitely going to be following up I'm definitely going to be putting my pronouns onto my emails and I'll be on Twitter tonight and changing that up so thank you very much for that advice earlier Eric um, and so um, thank you to all of you for joining us tonight you will know that we always end by telling you what we've got coming up um, next week um, we've got uh, to look or not to look exploring the ethical challenges of Facebook we're going to be uh, joined uh, next week by Tarsim who's going to talk us through that and then we've got the other sessions coming up that you can see in front of you there I think the team will be putting into the chat now the link to register for next week because I know some people link straight away and go um, straight in and register for next week's session so I'm looking at the team thinking that they're putting that into that now 
Um, but thank you very much for joining us tonight. As Kelly said, what was really interesting was actually the numbers went up and up and up as time went on tonight, whereas often we, we tend to go down a little bit as people have you know want to get off but tonight the numbers just kept on going up so thank you so much to everybody for speaking and good night